Uh, wherever you are in the world, welcome uh, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Walker. I'm the Maritime Project Leader and Senior Researcher at the Institute for Security Studies. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the seminar today on a future proofing Africa against uh, maritime security challenges. I'm about to hand over to our chair today, the AU Legal Council Ambassador, Dr. Namira Nakem. Uh, my responsibility at this time is just to share a few housekeeping issues. Um, while the speakers are going to keep their microphones and videos on, we request that as this is a large group that uh, all participants keep their videos and microphones off uh, until the Q&A section if you have a question that you would like to pose. Uh, if you move your mouse over the Zoom screen to the bottom, you will see the toolbar provides translation options, as well as the opportunity to see who else is participating in the meeting, and also the chat function if you would like to send messages uh, to the group or to individuals. Please do keep monitoring that chat function, as we from time to time will be posting a few links or reports which are referred to during the course of the presentations today. My final word, is I'm delighted we have a wonderfully diverse uh, online audience representing several African member states uh, alongside officials, diplomats and NGOs and academics. Uh, thank you all for joining us and with that Namira I pass the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Tim and uh, good day to everyone uh, who is joining us from various time zones. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Um, uh, to the sixth celebration of African Day of Season Oceans. At the outset, I would like to thank our ISS partners for co-organizing this pertinent event with the Office of the Legal Council of the African Union. Without further ado, let me first give you a brief background and objectives of this important event. As you may be aware, the Assembly of Heads of States and Governments of the African Union at its 22nd ordinary session declared the 2015-2025 as a decade of the decade of African seas and oceans and the date of 25th of July as African Day of Seas and Oceans. The overall objective of the celebration of the Africa Day of Seas and Oceans will be to put maritime governance for sustainable development at the center of Africa's safety, security, economic and social growth under the global framework of AU adopted instruments such as the Lomé Charter and the African Maritime Strategy. One of the key messages, or if you want the watchword that should come out of this year's celebration should be that in terms of maritime security, Africa's economic growth potential over the next 50 years present both opportunities and challenges. Therefore, continued instability and insecurity at sea will hinder African communities and states' ability to conduct maritime trade safely and securely, achieve inclusive economic yeah, growth, problem, of course, and social development, and meet their international commitments, as well as the successful integration of the imported and exported products in and out of Africa to the global economy will require access to safe and secure maritime transit channels. Don't forget, we have just had the CFTA entered into force and we kickstarted the trade under the agreement among us. Without secure maritime transit channels, then I don't think we will gain the real fruits of such agreement. As a result, the maritime sector is critical to Africa's economic progress and prosperity. As a consequence, the AU has prioritized combating these difficulties in the agenda 2063 aspirations of 10-year implementation plan which includes the African blue ocean economy to boost sustainable and inclusive blue growth with, within dimensions as natural resources, energy trade, development, security, among others. The African Union will also meet 
some of the goals outlined in its constitutive act, such as promoting peace and security and achieving long-term economic developments, to name a few. The Assembly of Heads of States endorsed the 2050 Africa Integrated Maritime Strategy in January 2014 for this and other reasons. This was certainly a game changer for African marine policy in uncharted waters. Ladies and gentlemen, on the celebration, the concept of future-proofing Africa against maritime security challenges will be marked out by our three keynote speakers before being discussed and summarized by invited experts. Having said that, I'm confident that today's celebration will increase awareness among stakeholders of the strategic importance of maritime security in Africa. I thank you for your attention and wish you fruitful deliberations. Now I will wear my other hat. And in my capacity now as chair of the panel, I am pleased to introduce first His Excellency, um, Commissioner Bancoli. Uh, although he's no longer um, in need of introduction, I would like to say a few words. First, to thank him for his participation. And secondly, to point out to the audience that Commissioner Bancoli was elected in February this year and he has already uh, been tasked with a very daunting uh, exercise uh, to handle peace, security, and political affairs for Africa. He has a, a, a rich experience in the field. Uh, he was the former ambassador of Nigeria uh, to the African Union, so we'll go a long way before he assumed the responsibility of a commissioner. And uh, I'm sure all of you are eagerly waiting uh, to hear His Excellency's intervention. Commissioner Bancoli, you have the floor. Excellency, uh, dear sister, it's good to see you. Good to see you uh, too. Yes, no, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, we are very pleased to be part of this uh, historic meeting, uh, marking the African Day of the Seas and the Oceans. The continent's high seas from the Mediterranean in the north to the Red Sea, down to the Indian Ocean in the east, and to the Atlantic in the south and the west, around also the central to the Gulf of Guinea show us that our continent is structure, is sovereignty, his trade, his industrialization ambitions are all tied and linked with the oceans and the seas. I therefore really appreciate this webinar marking this day set aside by our African leaders. Regrettably though, We've had increasing security threats on Africa's high seas based on the transitional crimes, increasing tempo in terrorism, violent extremism, piracy, human trafficking, I can go on and on. But what is obvious is that we have a golden opportunity with as we commemorate this day 
to work together to defeat and make sure that our ICs and our oceans remain part of the lifeline and the structure for good governance, for peace and stability on our continent. As you have stated, it is also very clear that the 2050 Africa's Integrated Maritime Strategy adopted along with the Charter, African Charter on Maritime Security and Safety and Development in Africa are very important instruments to advance and create wealth in Africa's maritime domain. We believe with these instruments, we can facilitate better interstate dialogue and cooperation to enable collective action to utilize the potentials that we have in the maritime sector. We all have to work together to address the emerging trends of insecurity on our oceans and ices. How do we do this, Excellencies? We have to work together to strengthen the capacities of member states, of regional economic communities and regional mechanisms, as well as develop practical, develop, uh, practical mechanisms for greater coordination to make sure that a holistic approach is used by our naval forces, by our customs officials, by all those who have the coastal guards who have a stake on our high seas and oceans. It is therefore important that a day like this reminds us of how to respond early, act early to address the root causes of criminality, of piracy that have really, really taken over some parts of our ISIS. It is important that the webinar also realizes that I've continued to work with member states in this domain. It is one of our top priorities in the department. And just recently, with the support of the Office of the Legal Council, we signed last week an agreement, a MOU with the Gulf of Guinea Commission. I'm very, very proud to be associated with this day. I also believe that on behalf, having signed that treaty on behalf of His Excellency, Chairperson Musa Faki Muhammad, it gives us the opportunity to collaborate with our regional bodies, intergovernmental bodies, our relevant departments to make sure that the blue economy becomes a reality, that peace on the high seas will also mean peace on land, inland on the African continent. We do not just have coastal states, we have island states, we also have land-linked states that have really all depend on the high seas, depend on the resources of the oceans. For me, for us in the African Union, for this department, the unity of the African continent, both coastal, island, landlocked, all push and promote the common interest of Africans on the ISIS. I believe we must find the best mechanisms working together with the Office of the Legal Council to promote the implementation of the Lome Charter as well as the maritime strategy. In-house at the commission, we have to work together with our partners, with ourselves for effective and better coordination, coherence and synergy, both at the level of our member states and at regional level. Excellencies, let me recommend to this webinar that we need to promote an open-ended African Maritime Consultative Forum 
working with a strategic group that can facilitate periodic review to work with Africa's maritime domain and make it part of the Africa we want, a new Africa. The role of the state, maritime agencies, the customs, shipping authorities, the navies, the fishery bodies, all of us, we must rally around making our, 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 our oceans and our treaties more secured and more stable, and of course, more peaceful. In conclusion, let me assure you and the commission that we remain committed to the full exploitation and exploration of the resources of the maritime sector. We have to work towards this. We have to make sure that a rules-based international order, starting with the African continent, will make the resource commune the common heritage of humankind. I really want to thank you, my dear sister, for giving me this opportunity. And I want to really, again, congratulate all Africans on this memorable occasion, a day for peace, a day for stability, and of course, a day for good governance through better governance of the high seas and oceans. I thank you so much. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for your address. It was very pertinent and it's very important to ponder upon uh, some of the elements you raised because I think uh, it's very important for our continent uh, to work on some of these issues together. Um, then we, um, for now, we will move on to Mr. Fonte Akum, who is currently the Executive Director of the ISS. He has a vast international experience with a keen pan-African perspective, which has included directing the Lake Chad Basin program within ISS. Finally, he has a PhD in politics and international studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, my neighbor, source. Um, Dr. Akum, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, His Excellency Ambassador Bankole Adeoye, Commissioner for Political Affairs, Peace and Security at the African Union. His Excellency Stanislas Baba, Minister Advisor on the Sea to the President of uh, Togo and the EU Champion on Maritime Affairs. Um, Madam Chair of the webinar, um, Ambassador Namira Nehem. Uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, all virtual protocols respected. Uh, today, the Institute for Security Studies proudly joins and supports the African Union in celebrating the African Day of the Seas and Oceans. Please allow me to echo the words of the Commissioner, um, who states that Africa's 30,500 kilometers coastline and enormous maritime domain are replete with opportunities for the development of food, trade, and energy resources, alongside the imperative for protecting what are clearly sustainable sources for future prosperity. Maritime growth actually provides multiple spin-off benefits in jobs, logistics, and skills development when well integrated with land infrastructure. And because neither fish nor pirates respect international borders, our maritime policies are inherently cooperative and transnational. For the Institute, of Secu Institute for Security Studies, um, we work to ensure a peaceful and prosperous Africa by advancing human security through a number of um, areas of intervention, the first of which is evidence-based policy advice, uh, the second of which is technical support, the third is capacity building, and the fourth is strategic convening of webinars and celebrations just like this one. Allow me, if you would, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, to take you on a brief historical tangent. A little over a decade ago, almost two decades ago, the ISS identified an urgent need to contribute African-generated evidence-based research and analysis to support the enhancement of technical capacities and bolster policy and practices that seek to address maritime insecurity in Africa, but furthermore, to actually promote maritime development on the continent. Since then, we have continued to inform maritime strategy development 
and policy implementation that seeks to connect national, regional, and continental levels in order to foster effective, accountable, and transparent responses to maritime insecurity, and more importantly, to link responses to recovery and development of the maritime and blue economy sectors. Along the way, maritime and blue economy issues became a strategic piece of the working relationship between the African Union Commission and the ISS, as well as our engagement and collaboration with the various organs of the African Union Commission, regional economic communities, regional mechanisms as articulated by the commissioner and member states and international maritime organizations. Practically though, um, since 2015, uh, we have been happy and delightful uh, to collaborate with the AU Commission in celebrating Africa's Day of the Seas and Oceans. And on the 27th of November, 2018, in fact, on the margins of the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in Nairobi, Kenya, the ISS was honored to receive a special excellence award from the AU chairperson, His Excellency Musa Faki Muhammad, for our partnership in promoting Africa's blue economy. Um, ISS's current maritime project, which is largely supported by the government of Norway, recognizes that maritime insecurity is an acutely under acknowledged impediment to achieving the target of all sustainable development goals by 2030 and would largely also undermine Africa's journey to Agenda 2063, the Africa which we all want. There is great potential for synergy between the priority areas identified by the ISS as well as the AU as well and other partners regarding the cross-cutting objective of better maritime security and the creation of blue economies. The ISS on our part remains committed to continue assisting the African Union, regional economic communities, um, and regional mechanisms develop and implement maritime strategies. And um, building on support ISS provided to ECOWAS in the elaboration of the ECOWAS Integrated Maritime Strategy, which was adopted on 29th March, 2014, the ISS is currently supporting the Southern African Development Community, SADC, Standing Com Maritime Committee on the REX Integrated Maritime Security Strategy, which itself seeks to identify, understand, and combat maritime insecurity and transnational organized crime at sea in the region. Hence, it is clear that benefiting from the creation of sustainable blue economies requires and produces maritime security and vice versa. The ISS um, has identified maritime security experts as well at continental, regional and national levels. And these emerging global maritime network would be placed at the disposal of the African Union, our Rex and member state for capacity building required to prevent and combat maritime insecurity and enable the sustainable implementation of all relevant policies, strategies, and plans. And we would certainly encourage and support the development of a sustainable maritime strategic support group uh, within the AU that will provide a reliable exchange platform that will contribute to addressing, developing an emerging maritime security threat um, by creating more effective communications between content experts and the coordination of implementation support activities. In the words of the late Ambassador Nicolas Boakira, who was a member of the ISS Board of Trustees, Africa's ocean economy holds the key to the sustainable economic growth of the continent, but we are just beginning to scratch the surface, and ISS is proud to be a key partner in this effort. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fonte. I think you touched upon um, something we can carry on, uh, all of us. Um, the cooperation we have with ISS um, now has been uh, long enough to draw lessons learned out of it that we can share with uh, other institutions that we uh, can partner with, which I think is very important for our work. Um, I think um, the mutual uh, co collaboration and support we have with each other assist a lot in carrying the message of the strategy, the Loma Charter, to fall within the broader security perspective, which is what basically you addressed that now when we speak about maritime security, 
we are not only speaking about the illegal activities at sea, but also we are speaking about security in the broader perspective when it touches the issue of blue economy and sustainability of environment and the livelihood of the coastal communities in Africa. I think this is very pertinent and I think we have a lot of lessons learned to draw from your address today. Uh, now uh, for the um, uh, final uh, speaker, I would have the pleasure to, in, to welcome the representative of the African champion for maritime safety in Africa. Um, unfortunately, uh, His Excellency Stansilas Baba, who is in charge of maritime issues uh, for the president of Togo, uh, is unavailable uh, to join us today uh, for some health reasons. We wish him well. And uh, thankfully, he has uh, assigned uh, the director of his cabinet, Mr. Lara Pen. Uh, to carry his message. Uh, so basically, we will still uh, hear uh, the message from the representative of the champion. Uh, Monsieur Le Pen, vous avez la parole, s'il vous plaît. Madame, merci beaucoup. Effectivement, le ministre conseiller pour la mère du président de la République, le docteur Stanislas Baba. Um, Madame, thank you. Uh, Stanislas Baba, Mr. Stanislas Baba had a problem and uh, he apologizes for not being able to participate in this seminar. And he directed me to deliver his statement on his behalf. Mr. Chairperson of the African Union Commission, members of the Office of the Legal Council, the team of the Institute of Peace and Security Studies, it is an honor and a privilege for me on the occasion of the celebration of the African Day on Seas and Oceans to be able to be chosen to speak of one of the presenters in order to prepare Africa to face the challenges connected with maritime security. On behalf of my president and on my personal behalf, I wish to thank His Excellency, the Chairperson of the African Union, who has unrelentlessly uh, made available all the resources required for the campaign and to face up to the challenges created by um, the seas and the oceans. I also wish to thank the Office of the Legal Council and the entire team of the Peace and Security Studies Institute for setting up this panel that fits in with the celebration of the African Day on the seas, of the seas and the oceans. Before dwelling on the security challenges facing the African maritime space, it is important. And indeed, as you are well aware, out of the 54 countries of Africa, 48 are coastal states or insular states. So the territorial area covers some 13 million square kilometers and the continental area or the mainland is around 6 million square kilometers. Now 90% of the imports and exports of the continent go through the sea. A huge number of the maritime corridors as well as other strategic concerns fit into that area and a huge part of uh, the maritime cable go through the seas and oceans of Africa. Now that potential is a huge opportunity for sustainable development and would need to be protected. Now the development of transport and other activities within the Africa's maritime space had created, might I say, some threats which in includes piracy, um, armed attacks, problem of illegal trading, illegal trafficking, uh, including human trafficking, etc. Now, in view of the fact that instability in the maritime area 
affects states in Africa and inhibits their ability to carry out their work in a secure manner and inhibits their economic uh, development and to perform their or meet their international obligations. African states have set up organizations at the regional level to ensure security in their areas. I'm talking about the adoption of the Djibouti Code of Conduct in 2009, together with various amendments and another code in 2013. Then there is also the ECOWAS uh, Maritime Strategy and Africa's um, Code on the Seas and Oceans, which will go right up to uh, 20. 63. Now, these codes of conduct are now be, being translated into reality. Now, despite all these efforts that are being made by the states, threats still continue to exist. Even though there are some commendable initiatives carried out, but these are isolated initiatives. It is along those lines that the heads of state and government met in Lome on the 15th of October, 2016, in an extraordinary summit of the OAE, OAU in order to adopt the Lome Charter. To, to set up a mechanism to ensure that there is a campaign against maritime insecurity and to ensure the economic development of the African continent. Now that charter or that agreement forms part of the strategy that will go on to the year 2050 in order to secure the maritime space and to ensure the economic and social development of African countries. The Lome Charter has an extended scope of application and it takes care of the concerns of Africans, African countries uh, particularly when they have to face serious issues connected with their maritime security. It also covers areas of uh, prevention and even transnational cooperation in maritime matters. It's also intended to preempt to the extent possible any accident that might occur at sea affecting ships, members of the crew, and all other measures that are required in order to ensure the reasonable exploitation of maritime resources. In that way, they are guaranteed the possibility of having their desires or their goals achieved. Africa's development is being achieved through or under chapter four, and uh, which calls on African countries to activate their uh, policies to ensure that there is a development of their maritime policies. In the campaign against insecurity at sea, uh, cooperation between states is absolutely necessary. And in that regard, the Lome Charter, in general terms, requires that each state would need to develop a legal framework at the national level that aims at coordinating their activities at sea. And each state would need where they do not exist, have a framework of cooperation in the campaign against crime at sea and close cooperation at the continental level. And in that connection, it is useful to turn to various forms of cooperation at the regional level, which do exist currently within Africa and uh, which are relevant in order to enhance the required cooperation as stated in the charter. In addition, the provisions of Article 40 further require that there be legal cooperation to the extent possible, as broad as possible amongst the states. And we should be on the basis of bilateral and multilateral agreements and on the basis of national laws and legislation. That said, the said provisions do take into account uh, the specific or peculiar features peculiar to particular states. And in that way, guarantee that there is some mechanism for mutual cooperation so that there is an exchange of information among states, uh, whether it be in the case of uh, uh, their judicial or legal cooperation, the extradition of a person suspected. And uh, in our opinion, these 
should be based on what I consider a very important aspect, a common or joint definition of what is understood. You see, in the preamble of that charter, it is stated, or there is a concept in, in, enshrined therein, that is the definition of uh, terrorist, piracy, an armed campaign, or attack on a ship. So a legal framework is necessary for the states in their campaign against crime at sea. And lots of African countries have already adhered to that cooperation framework. And that is an addition to the Lome Charter. It is well known, particularly when it comes to the campaign against piracy, uh, that's one of the rights that uh, are asked for that form part of their territorial control. Now, in the area that is subject to the jurisdiction of a state, that state would be the only one competent or would have jurisdiction to apply the laws. So when it is within the sovereignty, sovereign space of a particular country, it is that particular state that would be required to ensure that it, the laws are observed. So this further cooperation could also enhance the level of cooperation. Uh, for instance, with respect to the extradition of persons who have been captured. Now, that concern over uh, checking priority well, um, is of vital importance. And in Yaoundé, uh, for instance, uh, there is training for officers that deal with maritime piracy. In other words, they would be able to go onto ships and ensure that there is security within the maritime area. And uh, maybe ensure that there is consent from states for ships to operate in their territorial waters. We can say for sure that it is urgent for peace to further revisit the Lome Charter to secure our maritime uh, borders. It is that charter as of today. It's that charter that is the main document and it is as it were the blueprint for Africa to ensure its economic takeoff. Let me pay tribute at this stage to those states of Africa that do have the legal framework for having drawn up laws that would enable them to deal with these piracies, prosecute them, try them even at sea. I'm thinking of a country like Seychelles, which already have laws that are applicable in that regard and more recently togo and nigeria that have incorporated in their penal code provisions that would enable them to arrest and detain those pirates that have been arrested within the gulf of guinea area so it is the opportunity for me therefore to urge all the other african countries to prepare draft and promulgate as and when necessary uh, policies or documents that are appropriate to ensure their national maritime security, to protect maritime trade and various illicit trading, and uh, enhance their ability to deal with uh, matters that would secure, uh, say, their ports, installations, maritime security at all levels that such security is required, national legislation that would guarantee uh, an efficient protection of their maritime resources. Ladies and gentlemen, the ratification by African states of the Lome Charter will supplement all other initiatives taken at the regional level to ensure security and would enable further opportunity to be offered um, to African states particularly those going through an emerging economy. It is the key to meet the challenge that we face with respect to maritime security and Africa's development. It's coming into force will enable Africa in its search for economic development 
and to ensure the well-being of its peoples. I wish you a good, um, great celebration of Africa's Day of the Seas and the Oceans, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Penn, for your statement. I think that's a most relevant contribution in uh, drafting those regulations that we want to put in place. And thanks to Togo that is in a position to contribute. Uh, thank you and thanks to Togo. where you will hear a commentary from uh, some of our experts that are joining us today. And we will start by Mr. Timothy Walker. You've all probably seen him when you started the session. Uh, Timothy is um, the Maritime Project Leader and a Senior Researcher at the Institute for Secu Security Studies in Pretoria, South Africa. Since 2011, he has worked to promote maritime security as a policy priority with organizations such as the AU, the Economic Community of Western African States, um, ECOWAS, the Intergovernmental Authority for Development in GAD, the Southern African Development Community, SADC, and the Indian, the Indian Ocean Rim Association. He is currently leading the implementation uh, of an ISS project to strengthen African maritime security institutions. Uh, we have been working closely with uh, Timothy, uh, especially in preparations of this Africa Day uh, celebration and previous ones. So uh, without further ado, Tim, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Namira. Um, thank you for the warm introduction and for the, the lovely reminder of the collaboration in the past. Um, and I feel that puts me in a position to be able to comment not just on what we've been um, listening to and thinking about today, but also some of the progress that's been made along the way so that we can start to identify where we are taking the conversation about better or enhanced African maritime security. One of the key things I'm pretty sure that to interrupt you sorry but mm. there are a lot of background noise so we are having issues to take to follow you okay so can you try and reduce my... the background noise i do hope that's better i apologize everyone for the background noise is okay. that better it's now not better. No. it is now okay uh, please accept my apologies for that um i'm not quite sure how that happened <laughs> Many, one of the main concepts I think that we are always encountering, talking about policy, about research, and on Africa and maritime security and blue economies is sea blindness. Uh, the condition or the kind of ambivalence that many encounter at a wide level throughout the world often as well, on how important the seas and oceans are to our development, to our economic growth aspirations and to our daily security. A very good example I could give is that if we were all meeting in person, and I do hope this time next year we can convene the meeting uh, in the AU complex once more, uh, that that is Addis Ababa. Uh, Ethiopia is not a coastal state and the location I am speaking from is Johannesburg in South Africa. Again, not particularly renowned as a coastal city, uh, but these cities would not be able to exist or be sustained without the guaranteed supply and trade and flow of maritime goods, maritime trades and services, which go all around the world. And it's not just in Africa as well, 16 landlocked or land-linked, I should say, member states of the African Union with 39 coastal states. Uh, but many of those landlocked states, if we look at the definition of the African Union's maritime strategy, which includes the importance of lakes and inland waters for things like blue economy, if it's fish, aquaculture, tourism and, uh, and, and ships and trade, it's a crucial continental wide and cross-cutting initiative and we can see i believe the makings of a 
loosening of the sea blindness and more of a momentum taking us towards what we might call better seamanship or navigation skills. Uh, what I mean by that is I believe from the research and the analysis I have done on the African Union's instruments. We've heard some of them uh, from a previous speaker on uh, the Lome Charter, on the Transport Charter, on the Integrated Strategy and the Blue Economy Strategy. That when you look at the overall AU architecture, Maritime may not feature by name until now with the Blue Economy Commission. Uh, what a wonderful step, a wonderful progress. Um, it is often implied, but it is becoming stronger. Uh, you look at the peace and security architecture in terms of the Peace and Security Council. Last week held a, uh, a meeting on the state of maritime security, particularly in the Gulf of Guinea. And I believe this is the sort of thing which should become regular. And I can see that happening very easily. What we do need to consider as well is that the maritime, what you might call geography or even the political geography of Africa is far more complex than I think we sometimes realize. The boundaries and borders at sea between many countries have not yet been determined and those will need to be determined to ensure joint prosperity and development in the future. There are many um, resources which are being discovered all the time and working out how to develop and benefit from them is going to be a crucial pillar of national policies going forward. One of the things which I neglected to mention uh, in terms of how we are able to do this meeting, like I say, it would be wonderful to all meet in Addis again in the future, but I know many people here are connected to this meeting from other places around the world. Indeed, um, our executive director, I think, is joining us from the United States right now. Uh, I can see in the participants list that Professor Christian Bürger is participating today now. He has initiated a project looking at submarine cables and their security and their functioning. And most of the internet traffic connecting us here today is being carried by those cables probably right now, bouncing back and forth underneath the sea an amazing advancement uh, of technology and uh, and a crucial part of any kind of future African development. Uh, their security, but also just making sure that everyone can benefit from that is key. I can relate a story of quite recently the of the Democratic Republic of Congo that a underwater avalanche um, destroyed or short circuited some of the submarine cables linking Nigeria to South Africa causing internet disruptions. That wouldn't have been known if those cables had not been disrupted, but it goes to show how even far under the waves, uh, what matters to us in terms of our daily trading, our um, communication with family or friends or meetings like this, is crucial on knowing and having good security at sea and under the waters, not just on the surface. Uh, the final thing I'll just mention before handing back over to you, Chair, is within the speeches today, we've noticed that the importance of collaboration and coordination between countries is essential. Many of the threats that individual countries face are shared by their neighbours and by other countries in their regions, but also indeed on other parts of the African continent. Uh, collaboration, sharing of lessons, as, as uh, the chair mentioned, and best practices is crucial. And one of the ones we, we should be exploring are the ideas of how we collectively manage our maritime zones. Uh, Dr. Vishal Serban, who I also see, is one of the participants today. I do encourage you to get in contact with everybody and to, like I say, use the participants list to uh, get to know everyone better. Uh, wrote a paper earlier this year looking at one of the key concepts which it was located within the 2050 Africa Integrated Strategy, the Combined Exclusive Zone idea. Now that is one of the key anchor points which 
in Africa and indeed I think the rest of the world is looking at to see how that develops. It is a subject we can continue to discuss later uh, in the questions or even after today as well. We are always looking to keep this conversation going and not just leave it up to single days. With that Chair, thank you for asking me to uh, summarise some of the key points I've observed today and highlight some of the things I think we can take forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. I think one of the issues that you raised that are very important to, to us uh, when it comes to trade security together is the issue of the, cap the cables at sea and, and also this is the threats to these cables, uh, whether the natural threats or the human threats. I think these are a very pertinent point. This point specifically is very pertinent. And I think it's also important uh, to um, clarify to all the audience that we have, you can ask questions either in the chat or you raise your hands after the experts will finish. We'll open the floor to, uh, to uh, all the participants to discuss these issues further. Um, I think many of the issues like the exclusive economic zone as well is very important. I'm not sure it's a, it's a far-fetched dream to have the African uh, exclusive uh, economic zone uh, together. Uh, but at least we can discuss the idea and see how it can fly and we can see how it can move forward because it will be important as well to address our security threats together. Uh, now, without further ado, we move to uh, our second expert, Dr. Ifesinachi Okafor Yarwood from University of St. Andrews. I hope I pronounced the name right. Uh, Dr. Yarwood is a lecturer at uh, the University of St. Andrews. She has generated critical insights around the blue economy, environmental justice, human security, maritime governance and security. Um, uh, Dr. Yarwood continues to advance the understanding of ocean sustainability and criminality as a question of resource management, environmental justice and the disproportionate effects of depleting resources on security poverty and equality. Dr. Yarwood, you have the floor, please. Chair, I believe Dr. Yarwood might be having some connectivity issues. Um, I do not see a name uh, still in the All right. list. So Let's move on to the, yes. Yeah. Until uh, she comes over, then I think uh, we move for the uh, third expert that we have today, which is uh, Mr. Roland Ajovi. Um, Mr. Ajovi is an international law expert for UNODC. Uh, global Maritime Crime Program. Uh, he is from Bena. He has been teaching international law for the last 20 plus years, especially human rights and international criminal law in France, Tanzania, and the United States. Monsieur Roland, vous avez la parole, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour tout le monde, et merci beaucoup de cette opportunité. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you. It looks as if since there have been so many statements or submissions or presentations in English, I will speak in French to strike a balance. Today, I want to talk about the UN initiative in the region where there is criminality at sea. Firstly, to go to the heart of our work, which is piracy, and then the two focal points that we deal with, one, legislative reform and training for legal officers, and then I will conclude with some uh, practical examples on what has been done. Now, crimes at sea are numerous. These are crimes committed within the maritime space. It could be crime that may be committed on earth, that is on land, but uh, do affect or touch in the seas. Now, the legal basis for maritime piracy is one, 
say, might I say, the customary laws or legislation and the cost of the um, conventional laws. For instance, we have Montevideo Convention. The difficulty that arises, whether we're talking about customary law or conventional law, is how our states have domesticated such norms um, in uh, such laws or conventions in their national laws. If you carry out an investigation, you would notice that maritime piracy that is well known in international conventional laws, well, not all laws face, not all countries, sorry, face such crimes. If you look at the criminal codes or the penal codes, um, there's no provision, you know, because it is out of that maritime space that states are able to set up um, their laws. And so the United Nations is working with states to try to reorganize their and incorporate in their criminal codes or criminal procedure ordinances the possibility of punishing or penalizing crimes committed at sea. So provision needs to be made for such crimes. We also to incorporate the universal jurisdiction component when it comes to um, piracy, for instance. It will apply in the same manner as international law. In other words, any act of piracy, regardless of where it occurs, all states across the world do have universal jurisdiction, regardless of the flag that it flies and the nationality. So the work that is done, I am based in Cotonou, but I also work in, in um, Abidjan and Lome. And I work with various countries to look into any gaps of or lacunae in their laws and to ensure that adequate legislation is provided in a manner consistent with international laws and how to domesticate such uh, conventions or laws. And we have more or less made some progress in those three countries, that is in Cote d'Ivoire, um, Togo, and uh, Benin. And so we've been working with uh, states in their efforts to ensure that they do have uh, Ensuite, nous that is consistent with international law. Then we organize training sessions so that legal officers can understand the specific features of maritime privacy, maritime criminality. Uh, so we take a very practical case. Interpol does organize uh, training sessions for police officers, judicial officers at the scene, at the crime scene. Uh, for instance, we had a, a crime scene in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, which in, we worked with the um, maritime, with, with the Cote d'Ivoire uh, maritime police. And uh, we collected all the documents for purposes of trial. Then we moved on to another session where we did have legal officers working as civil officers. Uh, the purpose is to ensure that everyone understand the meaning of maritime criminality and be able to work there. Some seminars to enable us to work with these legal officers that are at the core of the work we are doing and to understand the kind of applicable laws and if necessary to suggest uh, amendments. Now, this was done in Togo, Cote d'Ivoire and Benin, as well as in Gabon, yeah, more or less everywhere in Central Africa. So the work, the, 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 the program I'm working on is to show how we can work with the states to improve their laws and what uh, they can do to improve on the situation. And the last item on which I'll to conclude, there's never been any trial on piracy in West Africa. Now, 
with the support we have provided to states. We had a trial in Nigeria some time ago. We had one in Togo. The interesting thing is that we move from the states, the, 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 the stage of intellectual thinking, ideas, etc., to the stage of training, and after that, to real um, cases. So, with all the training sessions we have had, it is possible for us to know what should be done. And I was in at a trial in Togo, and uh, we were able to see how such a trial could take place with everyone present. For instance, there were the judges or the magistrates, and it was possible to convict the person something. And we had to face a challenge, namely the fact that the accused person was in some other country. And was it possible for us to have him arrested? So to have him extradited, um, there needed to be laws. And so they needed to have the universal jurisdiction. In the case of Nigeria, for instance, the two trials that we had were quite interesting. There was one where um, there was a pirate who was at sea. And uh, there are cases where you have accomplices of acts of piracy. And there, in the legal framework within Nigeria, with the cooperation, of the international community, it was possible for us to have those perpetrators of criminal acts at sea to be arrested. Um, so whether we're talking about uh, individuals or corporate aid entities, uh, for instance, there was a corporate body in Nigeria which was suspected, but subsequently um, it was brought to trial. In that way, we're a lot more familiar with what would happen. So that is the work being done by the UN agency, hand in hand with the states. We hope that this will be done in a systematic manner. In other words, states would arrest the pirates and then bring them before the courts or at the international level with a universal jurisdiction. It should also have laws that act as a deterrent. And uh, that's where I end. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Jogu, for uh, your intervention. And I wonder if Dr. Yarwood has joined us. I'm here. Good afternoon. OK, great. Dr. Yarwood, please, you have the floor. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you so much for, for having me. Um, to talk about the African Year of the Ocean, I'd like to focus my contribution around the need for centering the people when we want to talk about maritime security in Africa and ensuring that the resources on the continent actually works for the people. Because when we do this, we would go a long way in solving some of the current security issues that pervert the continent. And for this to happen, we have to reflect on how we are managing issues relating to our fisheries. And for that reason, I'm going to be talking about the need to consider what we see or what we center as a major security issue on the African continent. So for example, in 2013, the former president of the AU, um, Madame Zuma, noted that at the at the time, in the last five decades, that's 50 years, the continent had lost an estimated 50 billion to illegal fishing. And then compare that to the figure that the continent lost on the, in the Gulf of Aden to um, Paris and Amrabri at sea or from 2008 to 2012. It was estimated according to a research by um, researchers from LSE, it was estimated that the figure was 0 0.9 billion to $3.3 .3 billion. And the estimated amount that the pirates got from ransom from 2008 and 2012 is estimated at $500 million. In the Gulf of Guinea, 
alone in terms of the impact of illegal fishing. And, and I, I hope that you bear with me in, uh, as I segue between piracy and illegal fishing. A research conducted in 2013, note, 2017, sorry, noted that six West African countries lost an estimated $2.3 billion to illegal fishing alone. However, if we then look at the collective effort that is made at the continental level to address threats to security, we see the continuous centering of piracy and number at sea, whilst illegal fishing is relegated to the back. And this is my, um, my argument, my assertion, of course, this can be debated. And we see this, the evidence is reflected in the number of Security Council um, resolution, for example, in relation to addressing piracy and robbery at sea. There is actually none on issues of piracy, or oh, sorry, on issues of illegal fishing. This is despite the fact that fisheries is a source of livelihood for millions of people on the African continent. Of course, I need to note that when it comes to those resolutions, there's always this case of the urgency to address piracy and robbery at sea and illegal fishing or other threats piggybacked on it. But the main thing is that piracy is always centered. However, if we look at the statistics, we find that even the economic implication, the human security implication, does not warrant the continuous focusing on piracy and robbery whilst relegating the threat of illegal fishing, which is equally a very important issue, a big threat that undermines sustainability of livelihood for African fishers. Therefore, what I'm proposing or what I'm saying as we celebrate African Year of the Ocean is that African government must reevaluate their priorities. Piracy and amorbia at sea is a threat to peace and security. It is a threat to economic growth on the continent, but so is illegal fishing. And therefore, rather than the continual centering of that threat, we should really get to the point when we are holistically, truly holistically addressing the issue addressing the threats of piracy and mobility, addressing illegal human trafficking, and even piracy. And I say this because in some example, at least in, in the research that I've done, you will find that a lot of the people that are falling victim to illegal trafficking, for example, a lot of people that have turned to crime by um, drugs, joining drugs trafficking gang, or even engaging in, in, in prostitution or selling sex and, and servitude, giving their kids away to servitude, is as a result of the fact that fishing has become about survival rather than profit. And so in the absence of support from the state, for them to build resilience to their vulnerability in the absence of social security network, they are basically left on their own. And so when a criminal network or organized criminal network come and says, you have this boat, you have the expertise, why don't you do this? And this is actually why we see incidences like Amorbury at sea and sometimes piracy being on the increase. This is why we see incidences of irregular migration in West Africa and Central Africa, the regions are more familiar with in the increase. This is why we see the increase and in proliferation of not only prostitution or selling sex, but also with that, HIV, AIDS, and certain diseases in coastal communities. And, and basically addressing issues relating to fishery sustainability allows the continent to kill two birds with one stone. And I'd like to, at this point, conclude my presentation or my, my sort of submission by noting that the African Union have already identified the ocean as a frontier for African development. And this is something that is, uh, needs to be applauded. But unfortunately, what we are seeing from the research we have done is that as we or as coastal states seek or sought to develop their or expand their blue economy, expand port infrastructure, um, in, in sort of invest in offshore hydrocarbon, invest in tourism, what we are seeing is that fisher folk are losing their traditional fishing ground to make way for these things. And a lot of the times they are not being compensated. And then if you add to that, the impact of depleting resources, the impact of climate change, which is exacerbating the rate at which fish stock is, is depleting. And you have a group of people that basically 
do not have any means of support. They are basically trying to exist or survive at any time. It makes them ho ho hopeless prey in the hands of criminals. And I think this is something that the African Union should be aware of as we now have a blue economy strategy to ensure that coastal states do not continue to marginalize their African people in the name of the blue economy. They should actually be part of the solution to some of these problems um, that we have. And, and only then can we collectively really get to the point when the ocean indeed is used for the sustainable development of the African people as enshrined in the vision 2063 of the African Union. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Yarwood. I think um, when I presented you, my, the presentation was pertinent because you have uh, really addressed uh, a lot of points uh, no one addressed today, especially the socioeconomic impacts for the coastal communities and um, uh, its connection to not only the IU fishing and the regular maritime security threats, but also to different ailments in these communities uh, and its connection uh, to the livelihood uh, of Africa and our uh, goals. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, last but not least, uh, the last expert who will uh, comment is uh, Dr. Guy Fleury Netwari. Uh, he is a senior legal officer uh, at the Office of the Legal Counsel, basically my colleague, and uh, he is uh, he carries a PhD in um, the African Union law. He's a special his, his main speciality is international organizations. Um, uh, since he, he before joining the office, he was a lecturer in several universities uh, in France, in Canada, and in Egypt. And uh, he's originally from Burundi, and he, uh, since he joined the office, uh, he um, gained different uh, expertise, including the maritime one. Uh, coming from a landlocked country, he was not interested at all, but uh, he had to be pushed <laughs> to do it. And now I can uh, happily uh, say he is becoming an expert in the field. Uh, Dr. Guy, you have the floor. Monsieur Netwari, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup, Thank Ambassador. You. Ambassador, I would like to thank our colleagues and partners of the ISS for the co-organization with our office of this uh, commemorative day. As uh, Madam Ambassador Legal Counsel of the African Union said, the objective is clear because we would want to make our seas and oceans an element of well being for African communities in an environment of security. And this is uh, an uh, element that uh, was touched on by all the speakers, the relationship between Africa and the sea and the oceans. And uh, for uh, it has also given rise to some paradox because the maritime uh, uh, impact is a significant one and the contribution to sustainable development and the well being of the population. And it is rather dece deceiving also. Now, uh, disappointing, uh, we can talk about the danger. Uh, these, are, uh, these are areas where piracy is rife and there are nefarious activities and they endanger the coastal and maritime environment as well as the well-being and the health of the uh, coastal uh, populations. The good news is that at level of the continent, we have adopted an integrated approach, and it is through the instruments that have been adopted within the continental uh, organization. These two instruments that reflect this integrated approach, that is the Lomi Charter on security and uh, maritime safety and development, and also the African strategy for uh, seas and oceans uh, by 
2015. Uh, these two instruments deal with uh, issues and challenges of economic nature, uh, deal with fisheries, aquaculture, uh, maritime security, port security, the combating crime, and all issues that are related to security at the continental level with regards to uh, instruments. And uh, some may even say that is exaggerated. But the most interesting thing is the method that is being used. And this method is important uh, with regards to international law. Uh, if we look at the regional uh, uh, instruments that exist in Africa and other areas, because we need to deal with maritime issues in an integrated manner. This approach is uh, in line with uh, 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 sectoral approach, which is regulated separately, but systematically too in different uh, uh, instruments. Uh, and uh, sometimes it is seg the approach is segmented. But then in this manner and using this method, we also need to note that there are many challenges. Challenges are right. How do we apply this method to uh, rise up to all these challenges? This came uh, in the conversations and in the statements that were made by uh, the previous speakers. We need to go from intentions to concrete actions. The last uh, uh, speaker underscored that. But also in a, uh, in a hostile security context, uh, environment where there's an upsurge in insecurity. And uh, we definitely have to look into other sectors that also arrive with challenges. And on the legal plane, there's the issue of the lack of determination of maritime space, which leads to a, some form of legal insecurity when it comes to outlining uh, maritime space and international space and the impact on maritime activities it has an adverse effect and this is all uh, an offshoot of this challenge the global uh, development objective when we come to that uh, requires that we uh, delineate the space uh, and that uh, there's another element to be able to combat uh, illegal activities that are happening in those maritime areas. I will want to underscore, if you so allow me, the last aspect. And all the speakers underscore that we need to control the risk related to the use of these maritime areas by uh, criminal gangs, criminal networks. And I'd like to thank. Roland Anjoli for telling us that through the United Nations and this United Nations uh, agency, concrete actions are being taken in that area. And that is in line with the Lomi Charter in which state parties uh, are committed to develop uh, national laws in conformity with international maritime law in order to tackle all uh, uh, malfeasance on the sea and in all jurisdictions. The same convention deals with the establishment of national coordination structures. This is very important that we have such institutions in the implementation of the strategy and in the implementation of the charter. We can commend and welcome the fact that the United Nations Security Council through its resolution 1816, which resolution uh, came up with ideas to combat this upsurge in insecurity in the Ogaden Gulf and other regions are also witnessing an upsurge in this insecurity. And we need to see how African Union can resolve this through the uh, African Peace and Security Council. And then you have other issues that are difficult 
to tackle and deal with that is uh, illegal IUU fishing, uh, dog trafficking, and other uh, problems, related problems, many sectors in conclusion protection of maritime uh, environment, uh, delineating the space uh, and the fight against illicit illegal activities. So many issues that are dealt with by, it is difficult to articulate all this, but by in mind the, uh, uh, the uh, integrated approach, I guess we can succeed and also the emergency of taking uh, urgency of taking action now, because even if the challenges seem uh, scattered all over the place, let us remember that the potential is uh, enormous and the uh, investments by uh, for the on the continent, uh, but they are important for the implementation and the realization of our objectives as a continent. I thank you, Madam Chair. I hope I didn't speak for too long. Thank you, Dr. Gi, for your statement. Now, we have uh, had many observations. Uh, more, um, I think the first uh, uh, question. Questions. Um, the commissioner uh, will be best to address. Um, does the AU has a structure that, first of all, finance the procurement of security equipment for maritime forces? And secondly, give consultancy services in terms of security equipment's procurement? Thank you. Commissioner Bancoli, I think you are the best one to, to respond to that. And anyone uh, from the audience who is interested to raise a question, either write it in the chat or raise your hand and I will call you to, to uh, address the panelists or the experts. Commissioner. Is the commissioner still with us? I do not believe he is. I just looked down the participants list and I couldn't see his name. So perhaps we could uh, move on to another question for now. Yes. All right. Um, actually, the second question is for you, Tim. <laughs> uh, Ms. Lizzie Kumalo uh, wants you to share your views on the main maritime geopolitical challenges, and maybe also Dr. Yarwood can touch upon this as well after you finish. Please go ahead, Tim. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the geopolitical optics, you know, like a pair of glasses to look at Africa and the seas is, is really I would say increasing. I can see this in a lot of countries' foreign policies. Um, you've only got to look at what's happening in terms of the Indo-Pacific concept to see that many, many countries are now viewing the Indian Ocean as part of the Pacific Ocean as well, or a combined kind of thing, which doesn't seem to actually include Africa very often. Um, it seems that sometimes the the kind of the geography of the world is not being written from the African continent outwards. It's something which Africa is often quite marginalized within foreign policies or, or programs uh, as well. Uh, a good example I think could be as well that Africa is in effect, and this was something I believe that the previous uh, former commissioner back in 2010 uh, for peace and security said when he called Africa a big island and if you think of it in that way, it is indeed uh, with the Suez Canal uh, sort of making sure that it's not just a tiny, tiny little connection there. Um, ironically, when I would suppose ambassador as well, you would you know this as well with from Egypt too, that um, the uh, when the ever given ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, I know there are bridges over the Suez Canal, but but in effect, that ship reconnected Africa to <laughs> Asia, in effect, and stopped Africa being a big island again. It's just something to think about. 
again, about how we choose to think of Africa as a geographical uh, element. Um, with, the, with the Mediterranean Sea, with the Red Sea, with the Indian Ocean and with the, with the Atlantic and, and within the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic, what happens in the north and at the south parts are very different. So Africa has always been kind of pulled apart. It's never able to really kind of produce a, a coherent strategic vision, which has been, you know, since the days of the OAU as well, I'm thinking here, um, which is why when you read messages of the AIMS strategy or the Lomé Charter, you can see that these do provide that kind of strategic vision. Uh, which, um, like I say, are, are always in, not in conflict, but always in, in tension with other people's views of the world and where Africa fits within it as well. So I think it's very important for us here to think of Africa as, like I say, a, a big island with a maritime destiny, but also to start talking of Africa's role and place in the world where we intend to be in 20 or 20 years time, not just part of other people's strategies, but our own strategies as well. Um, like I say, we do have that. Uh, it, it is a very complex geopolitical environment. It is very difficult to get a good example being turned to many books on security or strategy. And you look for Africa in the index. There's barely any mention sometimes as well. So we need to write our own um strategies and visions going forward here as well and, and and that's where the platforms like the african union like the regional co communities as well uh are key in that regard and getting harmonization between them dr yarwood do you have further comments thank you so much tim i would pull your line or similar line to continue the conversation to then say that our ability to be able to write our own stories and show that we are actually in a position to call the shot, if I can put it that way, is for Africa to then ensure that a lot of these things that are happening, that they make strategic efforts to walk the talk in relation to funding. We have a lot of things, and this is actually why I feel that the, the geopolitics comes in because a lot of the projects or the, a lot of the ideas that are coming from outside is dictated by who is funding. And you see that then that in some of the responses, there's almost a politics playing on, especially in relation to, to the maritime, whereby this person wanna show that, oh, we're the one that got it right, or no, we're the ones that got it right. And sometimes you actually end up seeing a multiplication of ideas and, and wasting resources that could have ordinarily have been invested in something else. So I guess this is my way of saying that Africa really have a very important role to play in trying to understand its, its place and also highlight and, and going comfortably in the world to say, well, we recognize what we have and we deserve a seat on this table. And making this clear requires that we are also able to fund some of the things that is happening. We can no longer, I mean, forever, we can't rely on, on others to fund us. And this is one of the process that would lead us to then playing that strategic role in the geopolitical view of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Yarwood. The following question um, is basically, does the AU AIM Strategy 2050 have an implementation plan with measurable targets and timelines, which unit in the AU is responsible for driving the implementation process and how often does it give update reports highlighting the progress and challenges in the implementation? That's basically a question for, for me. Um, the AIM strategy, so far, uh, we are moving uh, slowly but surely towards having these measurable targets. We have a task force, not only the one in the departmental that I mentioned. There is another task force where we have member states and open-ended for the member states together with the commission and the regional economic communities and the REMS in order to have a coherent approach towards the implementation of the strategy. Um, we, of course, COVID delayed us a bit because we um, kick-started the process very actively in order to finalize the LUMI uh, charter annexes. But then we got delayed because of 
COVID, where we were supposed to have more meetings together and bring the experts in the room to go ahead with the measurable targets in order to, to mention it. When it comes to the reporting, we do report on the activities on, uh, on maritime that we do, be it my office or uh, the other commissioners who are working also on blue economy or maritime security via our uh, annual report and the report of the activities of the union that is presented by the chairperson on behalf of the commission, basically all of us. So that is to address that question. Um, the others, uh, the other comments that came in the chat box were uh, thanking uh, the speakers uh, in different formats and, and giving some comments in relation to the flagship projects. Um, there is another one about the illegal fishing is so clear as a loss of income for local population and is evident who is carrying on with this dangerous practice? What are the real and operational best practices that can stop and reverse this trend? Military action or other? Um, maybe uh, Tim can uh, respond to this and, uh, and then I will speak on behalf of governmental organizations. Tim, please. I, I'd actually like to, um, if, if that's okay, um, hand over to, to um, Dr. Yarwood because uh, as you can see in the chat as well, uh, numerous articles she's written over the last couple of years which have tackled this. Um, if, it's, if you don't mind, Ife, I'd like to, to hand over sure. to you. Sure, then... Dr. Yarwood, you have the floor. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much, Tim, and thank you as well for, for the question. I, I would say in the context of the fact that a lot of the fisheries agencies on the continent do not have the capacity to monitor, control, and survey the activities of vessels that have been licensed on the continent, that the navies that have these assets have a role to play. And this is something that is already trying to happen in case, in the case, I mean, the, the areas that I'm familiar with, with the Yaounde architecture, where we have different zones in Western Central Africa whereby they're trying to see whether the zonal agencies, that is the, the navies at the zonal levels, are able to then work together with the fisheries agencies to collaboratively. And this is actually, you know, when I talked about the need for holistically addressing the problem, this is what we mean, whereby those that doesn't have the assets work with those that have the information to solve the problem. So I guess if you call it military action because of the fact that the, the Navy are the military, then yes, there is absolutely a role and a discussion is not only in place, that cooperation and collaboration is already happening. And we see this actually a very good example in relation to the recent case in Nigeria, the attack of the Hei Yunfeng vessel in, in May last year. The information was actually shared by the Ministry of Fisheries in Côte d'Ivoire, you know, to, as part of the, the, the National Workforce on Fisheries part of the Fisheries Committee for West Central Gulf of Guinea. And this was how the information got out and the navies were able to act. So this is actually a singular example that tells you that we can kill two birds with one stone. Working collaboratively can help us solve the problem of piracy, but at the same time, combat illegal fishing on African waters. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. I, I just want to uh, touch upon first uh, in relation to IU fishing and military or other means. Um, unfortunately, military is not enough uh, because um, although the example the doctor gave is in relation to Nigeria, which is a big country with a big Navy that can actually do uh, a follow uh, and pursuit uh, for capturing uh, the vessels involved in illegal fishing. But we have coastal states that don't have that capacity. And this is where uh, the problem is, including some of our island states who have vast uh, areas that need to be policed when it comes to illegal activities at sea, including the IU fishing. Um, this is why I'm saying it's, um, it has to have the different folds, not only the intervention militarily, because not all of us have that capacity, but it's important, the coordination and collaboration, exactly like not only sharing the information, but those who have big navies and are interested in supporting those who have smaller navies, 
that will be also uh, important in the context of Africa. Um, one other aspect, that's why we keep speaking about all the uh, legal documents that we have produced uh, and the implementation of our strategies are very important, be it the environmental treaties uh, for the species, the migratory species, the um, illegal fishing practices, and all of these are coming from the UN or from the AU, we should carry them and make sure that they are implemented. Um, they are not just there um, uh, among us to discuss. We have to take it a step further and speak to our partners who support such illegal practices in our waters. This is very important. So the political aspect is there, the legal aspect is there, then the military, the military aspect is there. Now I move to um, uh, the um, uh, first uh, intervener who uh, raised the hand, uh, Nigeria Naval Attaché. Uh, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, for, for giving me the floor. Uh, I just wish to add a word or two, being a naval officer and a maritime security expert. Um, firstly, I have to thank and commend the, the director of the, of the legal department, AU, for a wonderful job in hosting this uh, event annually, and also the speakers. My, my point I, that I wish to share is, I think if Africa really, really wants to solve the maritime security issues on the continent, Africa must face the reality holistically. I mean, Dr. Yawood and team uh, brought it out clearly that Africa must own the narrative. Uh, that is, uh, if I recall well, what team said, and Dr. Yawood also said, Africa must sponsor, must pay, like they say, who, who pays uh, the Piper dictates the tune. We can't be depending on extracontinental interests to fund the security issues and also, um, uh, also dictate what, what we do. Uh, what I'm trying to say in essence, uh, Chair, is not one African country that I know of uh, can boast of a functional maritime ministry, for instance. We do have my, um, aviation ministry, labor ministry, and, and you name it. I think it's about time, even the AU itself does not have a standing maritime department. This, this confirms the adage of the African sea blindness we've been talking about. So, so you need to gather people, professionals, and task them with, look, we have a situation in this area. Look at it, make policies that will make us uh, uh, draw out the benefits Autonomy, it's good to hear that. But blue economy will not thrive if there's no security. And security will not uh, strive if you don't bring people that really operate in this environment that know the challenges. So, Chair, my, 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 my last take is that you can use your good office to begin to, to draw the attention of member states to look at the possibilities, those that don't have, to establish such maritime ministries, perhaps this will be a starting point in, in really understanding what the maritime environment means to us as a continent, as a country, and as a form of uh, employment and economic advancement. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. I think maybe it's, um, it's good uh, that uh, from your side to uh, push this further with Nigeria, uh, so it will be brought up by member states in our meetings. Um, at least my experience from my country, we do have an independent authority for marriage time, but usually the officials think from the narrow uh, national perspective. So the international cooperation is done on higher levels. Um, I agree with you. I think it's very important to uh, advance this in order to make sure that uh, the issues of uh, maritime, maritime security will be uh, a priority on our agenda and uh, be considered by our policymakers. Um, now, in in the ch there is uh, no more um, hands, but in the chat uh, we have um, a comment for IU fishing. Do you um, 
are you interested to implement port state measures agreement? Uh, maybe I'll hand that to uh, first uh, Mr. Anjovi, uh, and then uh, we'll see who else is interested to address that question. Roland, s'il vous plaît. Oui, merci bien. Roland, please. Yes, thank you. Within the UN Vienna Agency, well, no, let me correct one thing. We're not working on piracy. Uh, pollution, everything, maritime security, uh, maritime terrorism, and so on. As for the state measure agreement in the port, yes, that's one way of doing it, of, of, of providing a framework to control the fishing uh, business to ensure that revenue are generated for the state and not illegal fishing taking away the resources. But we have also the idea of using drones to help states. We talk about Navy and uh, the ability of state to have big Navy like, uh, like Nigeria to operate. But in the absence of a Navy, we can certainly use drones to monitor the waters. In Benin specifically, they have been trying to buy these bellies you put on the ship to track them into your water and see where they are and what activity that they, uh, they are doing. So, so there are other measures which should be expanded. Uh, states should share uh, lessons about what they are doing so that more measures are in place. I hope I address the question. Thank you very much. Um, is there any of the speakers want to uh, have another uh, participation to answer that question as well, to address it from a different perspective? You're free to take the floor. Um, thank yes, you. Yes, Dr. To, please. Okay, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to say in relation to the post-state measures agreement that actually this is one of the things that, that is very significant in showing us that it is not as simple as just rushing to sign up to something without them being able to implement it. And, and, and then it, it makes us to look quite unserious as if we're just there to sign, to be seen as being willing to do any, something about an issue, even when we know we do not have the capacity to do it. So far, about 25 of the 38 coastal states in Africa have signed the positive measures and yet you would ask, why do we still have, um, have incidences of illegal fishing in those waters? Why are they still not implementing those port measures agreement? And this brings us to the point of, of course, the need for um, working holistically, inter-regional, inter-country cooperation and collaboration is key to this. And, and I have thought perhaps, is there a lesson that the continent can learn from the Nauru agreement? This is um, the, the Pacific Island nations, about eight of them, they control 25% of the global tuna water around 2 billion. And as part of this agreement, the, the agreement they have is then that any vessel operating in their waters, for example, will have um, a tracker fitted, they will not operate in a certain area, they will not, I mean, there are norms that they have to meet to be able to actually have a, a license to operate in their waters. And if, I feel that the continent already have the platform, we have the economic blocks, we have ECOWAS, we have ACAS, we have SEDEC. I'm not saying that this should be replicated completely, but if we, if there are places we can learn good lessons, I think the continent should be very open to learning those lessons to improve and ensure sustainability, uh, sustainable exploitation of, of our fisheries resources. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Maybe just to add something on what you mentioned is in relation to um, the REMS, uh, uh, the RMOs and the FMOs, because also you mentioned the the Pacific Islands, but uh, there are other RFMOs and uh, RMOs. The African member states are not there or uh, they are not really present in the negotiations. They adopt their own decisions and they want to enforce them like uh, in, in different, uh, like for the migratory species, uh, like salmon, for example. Uh, so uh, if you have uh, one for the North Atlantic uh, Ocean and the other in the South Atlantic, and we're not represented in the North, but these are migratory species and they ask us to 
uh, take measures sometimes is beyond the capacity of our states. I remember when we were negotiating this in the UN, it was always a topic of fights because we refused to have something imposed on us that we were not part of the discussion. Um, moving on, we have a comment on blue economy strategy. Uh, we My Africa, Organization of African Women in Maritime, uh, practices a think globally and act locally strategy, and we are available and more than willing to assist and continue to partner with the AU through its huge network of 37 African nation membership strength, which make up our huge network. Uh, well noted, and uh, we will uh, contact you uh, bilaterally to see what we can do together. Um, any more questions? or comments. I would like to invite all the participants to check the chat box because there are uh, many uh, documents shared by Tim, by Dr. Yarwood, and uh, I think they are very uh, pertinent for our discussions and understanding and also from Peace Operations Building and Maritime Security about some of the AU relevant documents um the aim strategy the charter the africa blue economy strategy and the revised african maritime transport charter i think these are very important documents uh, that have been shared and uh, they will be uh, pertinent uh, for you to carry on and continue uh, the discussions uh, onward um yes timothy you have the floor thank you uh, um, I see Jean um, posted a comment, Ubuntu Wim Africa. Um, I had, had your hand up just now. Um, it's great to uh, it's great to see that. And uh, like I say, if you still want to um, maybe make a contribution, I, I would I would love that uh, if you could explain uh, with Wim Africa. I know there's been some recent uh, a launch, I think, of the West African uh, initiative, which happened with the IMO. So that is something to watch because. If I can recall the Lomé Charter Summit in, well, <laughs> in Lomé, excuse me. <laughs> um, there was a, the Women in Africa, the African Ship Owners Association and the African uh, Maritime Administrators were hugely influential in the side events and I think in some of the discussions uh, right in the core as well. So that platform provided by Women Africa is, is going to be absolutely essential uh, you know, 37 countries, I think. So I don't want to speak for you, Jean. I see your hands up. So I'll, 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 I'll mute myself. Thank you, Tim. And uh, Wuma Africa, you have the floor. We had the pleasure to uh, meet you and work with you. Uh, I remember when we had the, the side event in Nairobi, um, when you were very active, very present. And uh, I believe the women who were present um, made the event worth it, I have to say. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador Namira. Thank you very much, team, for all your support. Indeed, uh, WIM Africa, um, using our own strategy for achieving the blue economy and sustainability, we believe that we need to think, not only think globally, but act locally. The importance of NGOs, you know, that cannot be overemphasized. The NGOs are very relevant towards achieving the 2063 of the AU. With this huge network, we have all our women, a lot of them in the fisheries department, a lot of them in administrative department, and you can just name it. These women are out there ready to work, ready to assist, ready to help to begin to collect data. That's actually what we are working on right now. Data collection is very important, it's key, so that we can appreciate how many women are out there that need support, that need uh, assistance from the African Union and African Union partners as well. Well, actually I've said that in the chat and I'm glad that Ambassador Namira read it out. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Timothy. Thank you for the support ISS is giving Africa in this regard. Ubuntu, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well noted and definitely we will uh, be in touch uh, for uh, more collaboration with you and the organization. Um, all right, any other comments or questions? 
one thing I have, Chair, which I uh, just noted. Please, go um, ahead. Which, which, uh, which my colleague Dennis, uh, and thank you, Dennis. Dennis Reaver today, the ISS uh, researcher at the ISS, has done sterling work um, steering the conversation through the chat box as well. So thank you very much, Dennis, for that. Um, posted on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and its maritime implications. I think that's something which is uh, a fundamental pillar, anchor, if you wanted the nautical metaphor, for the future. Um, Ambassador, I know you've been uh, crucial in terms of getting the desire, the necessary number of ratifications at such a, a great speed as well, which was really encouraging. And um, if we think of our, I think our future populations in coastal cities and coastal countries and inland linked countries as well, the economic growth we need to develop is going to have a huge maritime element to it. It's more ship, more ships, more African seafarers, more African owned ships and built ships as well. So it's crucial. And I invite everyone to to uh, consider that as a key way forward as well is, is in terms of the free trade agreement. Um, the article we've posted as well has a Portuguese and a Arabic translation to it as well. And I believe there is a French translation shortly to be included as well because um while well today I mean, thank you to the translators as well for all the, the great work um you've been doing there because we, we we don't want conversations just to be always in in one language it's sometimes english when it comes to south africa uh, for us um, but we want to engage all the time with everybody in a way which everybody is comfortable and and we can all discuss on the same kind of wavelength and, and, and hymn sheet, as it were. So so thank you for that. And, and thank you for the platform that you've provided today, Ambassador and the Legal Council and the Commissioner from Peace, uh, Peace Affairs and Peace and Security as well, Political Affairs as well. Um, like I say, I, I'm, I had a Facebook notification earlier today of the 2016 Day of the Seas and Oceans. So I, I'm really feeling the momentum here and the, the story, like I say, that we've continued uh, from from then up until now can only increase uh, WIM Africa, um, the, the ship owners, the free trade agreement. There are so many growing appropriate frameworks, uh, which like I say, even if maritime is not mentioned within them, it's implied and we can bring that maritime mention explicitly into the conversation and help steer that, I believe, going forward. So I just wanted to say that as a as a kind of a closing remark from my side. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, from my side, I will uh, also share uh, the closing remarks in my mother tongue. Um, so for the Hadas Bilogat al Arabi. في نهاية اللقاء ولتلخيص سريعا لما دار في هذه الجلسة أود أن أود لايك أهمية هذا هذا الحدث لزيادة المعرفة بالوثائق I was very pleased to uh, actually be with you. Uh, thank you for uh, actually uh, telling us about the importance of combating uh, all these threats. Uh, it is very important to understand the importance of uh, taking care of the security of oceans and seas. It's very important to continue to push towards uh, the objectives of blue economy and to face all the security uh, challenges and threats uh, to our seas and oceans. Therefore, our discussion today, our dialogue today is really important. Uh, we have a lot of adopted uh, strategies and instruments. Uh, we have, of course, on top of which uh, the 2050 AIM strategy. So we have to continue. Uh, to do this within the uh, decade for African seas and oceans. I thank all uh, interpreters. I thank our partners from uh, the ISS, uh, the, uh, sorry, the 
the security, uh, the African Security Institute. Uh, I also uh, thank my colleagues from uh, AU uh, and uh, thank you for all the efforts uh, that you have exerted in order to make this uh, success event. Uh, thanks to all speakers who uh, participated the, uh, with the AU uh, in our uh, celebration. Thank you for your attention, and we hope that you carry the messages of our session to your government so that we can go ahead with facing security challenges, uh, facing uh, oceans and seas, and to have a better life for African people. Thank you. And I will see you again in other celebrations. Thank you and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace Allah fall upon all of you. Thank you very much. This is the closure of the session. Thank you and bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wishing you all the best. Stay safe. Thank all of you. you too. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.